Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, February 13th, 2019. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, NASA looking for pro proposals to go back to the moon. MU69 is, wait for it, not a snowman, but mashed pancakes. Uh, good night, opportunity. Uh, Mars One update, wah wah. Uh, Raptor engine tests from SpaceX, and some updates on InSight. Joining me this week, we've got on my screen, Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Kimberly, welcome. Hey, hey, Fraser. Happy podcast day, everyone. Yay, she said it. She said it. I always say it. I know, I know. You always act surprised. I'd, I'd love it. I love it. It's 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 like we we need more of these little memes. And so the fact that you've got one. I feel like that's our anchor meme, and now every we just time need more. one of our listeners like tweets at me, separate from the show, and wishes me a happy podcast day, it just makes my day. <laughs> Whatever day it is. We've also got Morgan Renberg. Morgan. Hey, unlike Mars One, I am still here. <laughs> oh, 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 that brutal. Was mean. Uh, but true. Paul is uh, away doing some kind of book thing, or he's speaking tonight, or something. Anyway. He's got something uh, that he's got to he's do. He's stuttering. Yeah, so we can't. He's, he's badly stuttering away. So he can't join us today. Uh, but that's all right because we've got an amazing guest, which we will get to in a second. But before we do, I just want to, as always, take a moment and give a big thank you and encourage everyone to join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. This is, of course, the executive producers of this show. Like, I know you think that I just say this, but I am not kidding. If you join the Weekly Space Hangout crew, you become the executive producer of the show, and you then go to help organize and bring on amazing guests here on the show. I have no idea what's planned. I just show up, and then I get to do these uh, interviews with incredible space scientists and, uh, and astronauts and astronomers. So uh, go to wshcrew.space. And you can find out how to join the community, join the conversation that's down below here in the on the show. And, uh, and of course, especially with Google Plus going away, if you were ever part of that community, all that important work is about to get wiped away, lost forever. So join the Weekly Space Hangout crew. All right, let's get into this week's guest. And joining us this week, we've got Dr. Luciano Les. Dr. Les, welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this hangout, my first hangout. <laughs> I've, uh, and ironically, uh, people will know the term hangout comes from Google Plus, which is now going away. But anyway, oh, right. shut down. Right. Yeah, but I promise this this won't be your last uh, chance to do a, a live show like this. So now you're you're a total trooper. I just got to say uh, you're in in Italy right now. I'm in Italy, yes, uh, at 2 a.m. in the morning. And this is live. So thank you so much for, for showing up and, and hanging out with us. And uh, I just want to sort of, if people have seen, there has been just an enormous amount of news that has come out of Cassini in the last uh, few months. Just a ton of amazing photographs and images and also a lot of really interesting science. And you had a lot to do with this. So who are you and, and what do you do? Well, in, uh, in life, I'm a professor of aerospace engineering. And uh, well, I was also a Cassini team member, science team member. I worked in the radio science team of, uh, of Cassini. And uh, if I look back, uh, I, I did my, I wrote my proposal in 1989. So my almost my entire scientific life uh, is tied to this uh, beautiful mission. And and which part of the mission did you work with? Well, I started my first experiment uh, uh, came in uh, 2002. Uh, actually, even earlier when we tried to use uh, uh, the radio link uh, uh, with Cassini to detect uh, low frequency gravitational waves. But the same uh, uh, experimental setup uh, was used uh, also to test uh, general relativity when uh, Cassini was uh, between Jupiter and Saturn in the middle of nowhere. 
so we had essentially for an entire month uh, the spacecraft uh, all for this experiment all for us in a sense something that became impossible when we approached Saturn. Now if you had actually detected those gravitational waves then you would have gotten the Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah, they, we knew that the chances uh, were low they were very low uh, but still uh, the Doppler technique is the only existing technique uh, uh, working at low frequencies. There are space missions, space interferometers, uh, like LIGO, but uh, with arms uh, of one mi 5 million kilometers uh, that will cover the same frequency range. But so far, uh, the Doppler technique is the only one. It's not sensitive enough, unfortunately. Right, so right. The range of sight is, is very, very short. And so on your way to Saturn, you were able to prove that once again, Einstein was right? Correct. Yes, uh, right. Uh, and uh, luckily, because it would have been... Uh, uh, that would have been the other Nobel Prize. ...moment uh, to find out that... Uh, that uh, our results uh, was contradicting general relativity. You know what, uh, science is uh, very conservative in a sense uh, to provide uh, important results, uh, one requires uh, really huge evidence. And uh, luckily we confirmed general relativity in a sense, but, uh, but uh, the real interest in the future will be uh, to test general relativity because everybody is almost sure that uh, it will break down at some uh, at some point. And it's just a matter of, of figuring out where uh, and when. Um, so, but then, of course, the most exciting part is Cassini gets to Saturn and starts to, to do a bunch of science. What were some of the scientific discoveries, maybe some of the recent ones that you were involved in that people could be familiar with? Well, the, the most recent one uh, relates uh, to the final part of the mission, when Cassini uh, 22 times uh, dived uh, between uh, the planet uh, and uh, the inner ring. So it almost grazed uh, the atmosphere of Saturn, uh, got a close, uh, very close look of the planet, uh, and uh, what we did, uh, again, using the radio link between uh, the Earth and, uh, and Cassini was uh, to probe uh, the interior structure of the planet. Uh, gravity is a way to pick through the surface uh, and also to determine the mass of the rings, uh, which uh, was uh, essentially the last piece uh, in a puzzle, which in the end uh, led uh, to the date, to, to, to the age of the rings. And this is one of the most, I mean, they call it the grand finale, and it really is this amazing maneuver that Cassini makes to go in between the planet and its rings and be able for the first time to measure the mass of the rings separate from the planet, a, a number which had been estimated, but which wasn't known. And you finally got that number and it gave you a very interesting finding about the future of Saturn's rings and the history. The, the past, especially the past in the age of the rings. Yes, right. This, uh, we used essentially six of these uh, proximal orbits uh, uh, six of the, uh, these dives uh, to to establish a radio ring uh, between uh, the ground station and Cassini. Essentially, uh, let me say one thing: there isn't a single instrument able to measure gravity on board the spacecraft uh, for this very simple reason that uh, uh, the spacecraft would be in free fall uh, with uh, every accelerometer. So. Uh, it's essentially impossible to measure gravity locally. Uh, every gravity measurement uh, involves two points and uh, a differential acceleration between two points. And one of these points uh, stays on the Earth, it's a ground antenna, and the other point is Cassini, which is uh, uh, falling freely in the gravity field of Saturn uh, and the rings. So, uh, Prior to the grand finale, it was impossible to determine the mass of the ring. 
uh, of the rings because essentially Saturn is very oblate and uh, uh, the, the mass of the rings, uh, the gravity signal uh, from the rings essentially uh, is, uh, is uh, completely confused uh, with the gravity signal coming from the oblateness of the planets. It was impossible, but when we, we, we passed uh, between the planet and the rings, uh, the rings uh, were pushing in one direction and Saturn uh, and Saturn oblateness in an opposite direction. So we were uh, able uh, to, Cassini was able to disentangle the two effects. Uh, I must say that uh, there were hints uh, on the fact that the mass of the rings uh, was uh, low. It came uh, from uh, the observation of density waves in the rings. Uh, and, uh, but this is uh, really the first dynamical measurement of the mass. I, and just More to give people uh, like a sense of like how much of a difference, how tiny of a difference in its trajectory was Cassini off that you that you were able to measure? Well, the the acceleration uh, I can tell you what uh, the acceleration of the rings is uh, with respect to the acceleration from the planet is about uh, ten uh, hundred million times smaller. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So we had to disentangle a, a, a huge effect uh, from the tiny effect coming from the rings. But thanks to the accuracy of uh, the radio system, imagine that uh, we have been able uh, with the Cassini radio system uh, to measure the velocity of the spacecraft with an accuracy of, uh, of uh, essentially 20, up to 20 microns per second. 20 microns per second is about uh, one thousandth uh, the, the speed of a snake. <laughs> right. Just to, to make a comparison. And still, even if I teach aerospace engineering, when I, I hear and I measure these numbers, uh, looks uh, amazing. Uh, really, the engineers uh, who devised this system did a fantastic job. I, and so this, and so after calculating the mass of the rings, this told you that the rings were young. I mean, this is this big controversy that, and I'm sure Morgan and I have had this conversation in the past, Morgan, of course, being our, our planetary scientist on the team about the age of Saturn's rings. They must be old, but they kind of look young. We don't know. Now we know. And the answer is strange. Well, uh, right. Uh, and uh, let me tell you that uh, within the science, Cassini science team, uh, there were people betting on the mass and therefore on the age. And I didn't take, take part uh, to all this bet because I had to provide the number and uh, people were anxiously waiting <laughs> for this number to come out. And uh, well, the, 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 how the mass is related to the age uh, is, uh, is uh, really clever and also simple in a sense, because there were two instruments uh, on board Cassini who measured uh, respectively the uh, flux of dust uh, in the Saturnian environment. And uh, this instrument is a CDA the measurement uh, has been uh, quite precise and it's been refined uh, because there is also a gravitational focusing created by, by Saturn. So the flux is known. Then uh, there was uh, another instrument, uh, which uh, is uh, the radar, which measured uh, essentially the percentage of uh, silicates of dust in the rings. And this turned out to be about uh, 1%, not uh, the absolute value of the mass of uh, the mass of the silicate, but only the percentage. Now, if you know the mass and you know the percentage of silicates, uh, you can uh, determine the total amount of silicates. And then uh, from the flux uh, and knowing the area of the rings, uh, one can determine the age. And one, uh, once we did uh, uh, this computation after the mass determination uh, that Cassini made, uh, it turned out to be at most uh, of the order of uh, 100 million years. Right. So, yeah. 10 
to 100 million years old that the right. rings were formed probably when the dinosaurs roamed the earth but not four and a half billion years ago that it you know here we are we're able to see lunar eclipses because the earth and the because the moon and the sun are roughly the same size in the sky it's it's a coincidence and here we are able to see the rings of saturn at the time that we're present as almost a, an amazing coincidence that the, when you think about the vast age that saturn is and the amount of time that the rings have been around and, and so d does this give you do you have any sort of favorite theory about what gave us the rings then in this fairly recent period well, the, we, we can certainly say that uh, we are living in a very lucky age. A lucky age because we had Cassini, which uh, went there, but also we can uh, really enjoy the beauty of the rings. Uh, I have no favorite theory. There are uh, several ideas on what uh, could have caused the rings. It can be a catastrophic event uh, like a collision of a fairly large obje object uh, called the centaur, or the, the, the tidal the, the disruption of an icy object. And this is also another possibility. Anyway, catastrophic events, uh, most likely. I have no favorite theory, taking into account that I teach aerospace engineering, so I make measurements. <laughs> right, so and, whatever you can measure. Uh, however, uh, there is a debate, and this is something uh, that... Uh, that will stimulate discussion in the future, but certainly to have a better ideas uh, of, of what formed the rings uh, when I to go there and probably sample the rings. Uh, I've got a question from the chat from Arjon who asks, were you worried about losing communication ability by getting hit while diving between Saturn and its rings? I mean, were you nervous about this maneuver? No, no, not at all. Uh, not at all because uh, uh, there was a fairly good assessment uh, of the in particle environments uh, where Cassini was flowing. And indeed, uh, there are uh, particles, but uh, you can, the density of these particles and, uh, and also the size of these particles, it's pretty much like smoke. So, nothing uh, that could seriously damage the spacecraft. I personally was not nervous. No. He and it, I, I'm just kind of like, wouldn't it be cool to actually go through the rings? Do you think it could handle that? Sure, but Cassini did go through the rings uh, uh, during the Saturn orbit insertion. It passed uh, in a gap uh, between the rings. In a gap, yeah. Yeah, no gap, yes. like and, right uh, through. And, uh, and uh, the antenna, the high gain antenna was pointed in the RAM direction uh, acting as a shield, a potential shield. So from that point of view, I mean, it's, uh, you know, in that case, uh, at that time I was younger and I was, uh, I was uh, a little bit more uh, anxious uh, that, uh, than I was now. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's sad that Cassini has gone, but it has done, delivered so much science and and I know that astronomers are going to continue to pour through the data that was that was sent back. This is just one example. I mean, we are a year and a half after its after its loss, and still these amazing insights are 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 coming out. Is there anything that perhaps you're working on? Anything that you find interesting right now? Stuff that we should be looking forward to? Well, there are many, but uh, concerning the grand finale, the grand finale offers us uh, the possibility also to, to peek uh, through the layer of clouds. And one of the results that we obtain and on which uh, people will have, have certainly to work, especially people doing uh, modeling of uh, gas giant interior is, uh, is uh, are the results of Cassini. And uh, we detected also the depth of the winds on uh, on Saturn, which is uh, much deeper than uh, on Jupiter, for example. Uh, so the winds that we see on the surface, you, you know, the banded structure that we see, 
goes down uh, to 9,000 kilometers, so 15% or more than the radius of the, radius of the planet. Very deep. Uh, and uh, also another important discovery was uh, uh, a better uh, determination of the mass of the core, which uh, amounts to about 15 uh, to 18 uh, solar masses. All these results have been inferred from gravity and magnetic measurements uh, by theorists, but certainly this data will be further interpreted uh, and refined in the future. So there is a lot to work, uh, uh, still to work on Cassini data. And I think uh, the next generation of scientists uh, will, uh, will get uh, inspiration from, uh, from the results of Cassini, for sure. And it, it, there is a lot of work to do. And it, I mean, it breaks my heart that we don't have a mission at Saturn anymore. I mean, one of the most important planets in the solar system studied to f show just how amazing this world and its moons and its rings are. And now our explorer is is gone. We need to get back there with more science and keep going. Titan, we got to land on Titan and go into the oceans and right, right? Uh, with the first boat. Uh, yeah, we, we have to put a boat on Titan. <laughs> yeah. I totally agree. With you. Yeah. Yes, that that would be would be fantastic. But sooner or later it will come. There are so many interesting things in the solar system. One is just to pick. Uh, to pick one at a time, unfortunately. Well, on that note, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to join us uh, tonight. Um, if people want to follow what you're doing, where is a great place for them to go? Well, uh, certainly the Cassini webpage uh, gives uh, an overview of uh, what uh, we are doing. I have a website, uh, the Radio Science website, uh, However, uh, it's not so updated. I really suggest to go to the, the main Cassini, Cassini site, NASA, Cassini NASA website. There is a lot of information there. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, absolute pleasure. Uh, and now we'll we'll let you go to bed. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank take you. care. Goodbye to everyone. Bye Thanks. bye. Bye. All right. Um, let's move on with the news, man. That was so great. What a, I love Saturn. What? A, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just that, I mean, the yeah. science. I mean, we were just like, it was like Saturn, 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 nonstop for the last two months or so. We've been reporting on so many Saturn stories. And it was great to be able to talk to somebody who, who There'll was, be more was next involved. month. I know, it probably will be. And the be. next and the next and yeah, the next. Yeah, for, until for months now. Thankfully. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, Kimberly, you're on my screen. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about the end of an era, which is the official final ending of the Opportunity rover on Mars, which uh, we know that back in June, NASA lost contact with Opportunity during the global dust storm that overtook Mars for about three months. Uh, Opportunity was no longer able to charge its solar powered batteries. It went into a hibernation mode and went out of contact. NASA has been trying for the past, was it eight months, nine months almost, to get back into contact with the rover. They sent 835 different recovery commands to the rover. And the last one they tried was late last night. And the word came this morning that Opportunity did not respond. And so NASA has officially called the mission complete and it's going to stop trying to recover it. Uh, which is sad because this rover has been roving around for 15 years. Yeah. Uh, way, 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 way longer than anyone had ever expected Opportunity to be operating. As a reminder, it and Spirit were expected to run for 90 days back in 2004 uh, and only go about, what, like 1,100 yards or something like that. An opportunity <laughs> lasted for 15 years and went over 45 kilometers in distance, uh, which is by far the longest distance that anything has traveled on the surface of another planet. So it, it ran a marathon in 15 years uh, and explored uh, such a wonderfully diverse part of Mars, uh, looking at 
plains and dunes and hundreds of craters and valleys and hills and mountains, um, discovered some of the first in situ evidence that liquid water flowed on the Martian surface, which we didn't know in 2004. Just as a reminder, we didn't know that for sure. Yeah. Uh, and Spirit and Opportunity picked up those rocks and said, yep, there was water here. And uh, did 15 years of measurements of how the sun penetrates the Martian atmosphere and charges solar panels, which will be invaluable to future missions uh, and human exploration on the surface of Mars. And just sort of, we all sort of fell in love with Spirit and, and with Oppie, and now they're both gone. Yeah. Uh, it's it's impossible to sort of overstate how successful these were. I think when we look back, you know, 10 or 15 or 50 years from now, Opportunity and Spirit will rate up there with Hubble and Voyager as the most successful robotic NASA missions uh, of all time. And it just illustrates the kind of lottery nature of exploring the solar system where, you know, there is no guarantee that this is how it was going to plan out or pan out. Lots, lots of times we've sent a mission and it hasn't worked or we've sent a mission and it's done exactly what it was supposed to do. And, and then it stopped. You never really know what time is going to be that, that magic time when everything just comes together and you get lucky and you get good and you just learn a tremendous amount and you know it'll be decades before we get as lucky as we got and we're as good as we were with opportunity and, and spirit and we should just be thankful for having the oppor having had the the chance to um experience that and look forward to the next time it happens the opportunity you were gonna you're about to say that oh, did you? Did. you were I gonna almost, you were gonna yeah. say it weren't you yeah so many puns lost yeah darn uh, that's the spirit of it yeah ha, i mean ha. i mean when you think about i mean the part that's kind of amazing is you think about the the expenses of this right like uh they were 400 million dollars i think and when you compare that to Seriously? like curiosity yeah curiosity is in the whatever two and a half billion three billion mark uh, much, same, much more. same with Mars 2020 rover. Like they were done on a shoestring budget. They lasted for an enormous amount of time, way beyond the the length of time that anyone ever expected, and just delivered so much science. Redefined the way you send payloads to the surface of Mars using that. You know, following what what they learned with um, the original. Was it the Mars? pathfinder you know following on that and so, perfecting so that technique and creating just a really durable platform i i think it would have been perfectly viable and i wouldn't be surprised even today if they go and they they could make many more i, I don't know i'd be okay with that yeah would you want a curiosity or 10 would you like the mars 2020 rover or 10 more opportunities crawling around at different places uh, the leftover pieces of of spirit and opportunity uh, went into a bunch of other things as well. Much of the 2007 Phoenix Mars lander was built out of spare parts. Uh, and I think even sort of all the way up to Insight today is built on the same fundamental engineering platform that was built for, for spirit and opportunity. And so it was a, a design, a class of, of missions that has been astonishingly successful and, and, isn't that great? You know, we, we got lucky. We did it. Uh, but we'll be doing new things and better things in the years to come. All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, jump in here and give everyone an update. So uh, in, in, the, in the words of Ars Technica, uh, to no one's surprise, Mars One is done. So I'll bring up the uh, the story surprise. here. Yeah, surprise, surprise. So for people who don't remember what Mars One is, it was <laughs> you don't remember what Mars One is, and yet you're no, you're know. not surprised. Mars yeah. One was was a some kind of cross between the colonization of Mars and a reality TV show that would choose from uh, tens of thousands of of applicants. A small group of people would be sent on a one-way trip to Mars where they would 
uh, live and they would broadcast their day-to-day existence and through the advertising and all of the various fundraising they would go through, they would be able to, to fund this. Uh, nobody thought this had any chance at all of actually happening and yet they did generate a tremendous amount of press. I don't know if you remember, we interviewed the founder, Bass Landorp, here on the Weekly Space Hangout. That was w- one of the most unbelievable interviews we've, we've I, ever I, done. I thought, it was, I thought I was tough but fair. <laughs> I thought yeah, it, it was. It was a, it, so, I mean, I think, so, so the, the news is that, um, that it has uh, filed for bankruptcy. And the commercial side, not the nonprofit side, right? Uh, I don't know if there was a nonprofit side to go along with it. I think there might technically have been. Yeah. So the um, uh, so now it's in a uh, civil court in Switzerland. They've opened uh, bankruptcy proceedings in mid January, and we're going to find out what happens now. But I think we can at this point we can assume that the the Mars One project is over but uh i would can can i spin this into a a bigger uh a bigger point Uh, anybody who knew anything knew mars one wasn't going to work fine it failed uh but the it i think it highlights really well the challenge that we're going to have landing people on mars um because their goal of mars one was to make it a one-way trip you were going to mars you were going to live there and you know I, i don't know if most people know it but humans tend to live for a long time and just think of all the companies you've ever heard of and how many of them have stayed in business for 40 or 50 or 60 years. You know, SpaceX has a hundred, a thousand times more realistic path towards landing humans on Mars. But I'm not sure I'd say they have a dramatically larger likelihood of lasting the next 50 or 70 years. Not that many companies do. And, and so when we start thinking about the idea of settling people on Mars, we've got to kind of answer the question, who's going to support that? And if that company goes under, uh, it, is NASA going to start launching missions to Mars just to airdrop people food for 50 years? Yeah, yeah. Th- these are hard, hard questions that we are not close to, to solving. So even if we can go to Mars, and I think we will in the next couple of decades, I think we're a, a long way from uh, living on Mars in an ethical and yeah. sort of humane way. And so the, in, the, in the sort of the same week, we got the news from Elon Musk that he was explaining the economics of what it's going to take to be able to send humans to Mars with SpaceX. And he expects for the first round, they'll probably be able to get the price for going to Mars at about 500000 And for within the next couple of decades, the price will be more down around $100,000 per person for a round trip to Mars. So if you go to Mars, you can also come home whenever you, you wanted to. The, the one thing that I, that, the idea that I did like about, about Mars One was this idea of investing the money that they were, they were bringing in on on a lot of the other projects. So there was a lot of projects in terms of outreach, but also things like greenhouse projects and building projects. Like there are so many details that are required to be able to live on Mars from how you're going to breathe, where you're going to go to the bathroom, how you're going to grow your food, uh, how you're going to be protected from radiation, how are you going to maintain contact with Earth, communicate, how is finance banking going to work, how is the government going to work, it just goes on and on and on. There's so many questions that have to be figured out. And right now, all we know is that at some point, the SpaceX Starship is going to land on Mars. The The pod bay doors are going to open up and people are just going to walk out onto the surface of Mars and then just wonder what we're going to do now, right? And, and ga- and, until their oxygen tanks wrap up. So even if we have the rocket capability to send people to Mars we don't have the infrastructure for people to be able to survive long term and so i think that that i i wouldn't be surprised if we get to this point where yeah we can prove it you know spacex is sending rockets to mars and they're landing and they're but there is there just isn't that infrastructure for people to be able to survive long term and they're going to have to do all the hard work of where do you go to the bathroom and how do you eat and so on and so forth and so yeah i think we are a long long way from being able to go to mars 
if ever. So we'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So can't say it'll be in your lifetime or mine, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah. Someone's. <laughs> Morgan, what do you got? Well, the trickle of news out of New Horizons has continued to flow in 2019. And for the most part, it's just been sort of higher resolution versions of those first pictures of 2014 MU69. Uh, and they're great. And we're learning a lot from them, but they haven't sort of totally surprised us. Uh, that is up until this week. Because uh, this week we got back the first of a series of pictures that were taken after New Horizons flew by the, the object. It turned, pointed its camera sort of back towards the sun. You might remember from Pluto this beautiful picture of the Pluto atmosphere backlit by the sun. And this is the same kind of picture, um, except of course MU69 doesn't have an atmosphere. Uh, so it's just kind of like this dark blob. and. That might not seem that interesting, but the blob was blocking out background stars. And so what this did in effect is give us a different angle on, on the object to see what shape it was. And what we thought looked like a pair of spheres kind of snowballed together now looks more like, uh, I don't know, like a cashew and a pancake. Or, or something, and especially the part we were calling the body of the snowman before is incredibly thin. In it's kind of a shape that you don't see a lot in space. Things when they're forming in space tend to form in spheres because gravity is pulling in all directions. You don't get a lot of flat objects unless it's spinning a lot. And there's no reason to think that something like that would have happened here. So it's just weird. Yeah, yeah. and. And so you can kind of, I mean, to try and imagine the scenario that would have that would have formed them into these kinds of shapes and then brought them together, and you wonder, are are these are we going to see more of things like this? Like, were they spinning rapidly as and flattened out and then came together like discs? It's a it's an amazing shape. We need well, more data. We do. And one of the one of the weird things with this shape is that we already know from other measurements that this object is actually spinning rather slowly and much more slowly than we had expected. So with this weird shape, usually with weird shapes or awkward gouges out of spherical things, you assume an impact happened at some point. Uh, and impacts tend to impart a lot of momentum and speed things up but this object is moving rather slowly. So that's kind of weird. And another question it brings up is what's going on with the bright necklace? Because uh, when we had assumed that there were two spheres, we thought, hey, maybe there were some loose particles that sort of like flowed downhill, down, rolled down the spheres and accumulated at the neck. And that's why it's full of bright stuff. But with a flat object, things don't tend to roll down a flat thing. Uh, and so now I'm wondering what the new idea about this necklace is going to be. We're kind of in the, the nitty gritty into the weeds part of planetary science now. Like back when we flew by in January, we were still sort of in this, this halcyon period where we thought MU69 can be representative of all small Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, I think I may have even said that. I think said you that. said that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe less than six Morgan. weeks ago. Um, but you know, that's the problem with you know, planetary science is when you get down and actually look at something, not, you know, from millions of kilometers away, but from right there, uh, every object looks different. And I bet you there's no planetary scientist that will argue that most Kuiper Belt objects are <laughs> binary pairs of pancake-like objects that, you know, that just doesn't, still doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. So now we are going to have to spend our time kind of disentangling in what ways does MU69 represent the broader class of objects, maybe by its composition or its color? And in what ways is it totally unique, like the A pancake. Yeah. yeah. I am pancake. really getting on board with your plan, Morgan. Like, see all the things. That, that it's clear now that we've seen enough of these objects, and they're all dramatically different enough from each other that it is now time to seriously figure out some way to see as many of these objects as possible, as inexpensively as possible, to 
to just start to build some rules because this is madness. It looks nothing like no, Pluto. No, this is the solar system. Yeah. Yeah, it looks nothing like Pluto. Uh, I have no shame. And this is and this is the only one that we've seen. So uh, apart from Pluto. So we got Pluto, we got Sharon, and we've got this pancake walnut monster. So that's so, a great name for this type of object. I'm going to officially call it you... the pancake walnut monster. All right. Perfect. We, Done. Pan, pancake walnut. Submit it to the IAU. All right. <laughs> Let's hope it sticks. Um, and then people would be like, oh, I remember when there was nine pancake walnut monsters in the solar system. And now there's only eight. <laughs> so I don't want to be a part of that. All right. Everyone knows I love pancakes. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Morgan, uh, I think you've got another story for us. Yeah, we got some uh, interesting news out of NASA this week. Uh, They've officially distributed a call for proposals uh, from aerospace companies to develop the next generation of spacecraft necessary to land on the moon. And it's you're going to have to kind of stick with us here because it's going to get a little hairy. I've I've got some Uh, visual representations. You tell me when you want me to change slides for you, okay? Yeah, so we start off. This is all is supposed to sort of go down within the next decade or so, culminating with a landing, human landing on the moon, you know, in the end of the 2020s. Uh, what NASA is offering right now is an early opportunity to sort of do feasibility studies to see what what kinds of spacecraft designs are, are practical, uh, but they're injecting some pretty specific constraints. Uh, and one of the constraints is, is that there's going to be three or four different kinds of spacecraft, depending on how you count them. Uh, Their idea of a mission, and maybe you want to jump straight to the third picture here. We'll just kind of go full bore into it and and then back off. Yeah, this is this is gnarly. Um, (laughs) This is is a hell of a thing. The idea. What the heck? Yeah, the idea here is that every landing will have three different spacecraft. It'll have what they're calling the descent vehicle, which is uh, the bottom part of the limb if we think in Apollo terms, it's the part the spacecraft that'll land them on the moon. There's the ascent vehicle, which is the part that will blast them off of the moon and uh, back into lunar orbit. And then there's the crew transfer vehicle. Uh, and all of these things are joined as a hub by this lunar exploration gateway, which is presumably sort of like the deep space gateway uh, that we've talked about before. It's a, a space station in uh, sort of between the Earth and the Moon, where these various things would dock. And so if you were a NASA astronaut landing on the Moon, you would blast off of Earth on a an SLS rocket. And this vehicle would Okay, you've lost you... me there. Sorry, yeah, you, you, you've lost you, me in you, SLS. With SLS? Yeah, so you would, you would blast off, and this vehicle would take you to the space station. You'd go into the space station, and you'd transfer into your lunar descent vehicle, uh, which would take you down to the Moon, where you would... I think presumably like go with the lunar ascent vehicle that would eventually take you back to the space station, which would then load you back into the shuttle to take you back to, to earth. Uh, and you'll see on the left, there's all these different rockets. These things can't all fit on one rocket. Uh, NASA is mandated by Congress to use the SLS for certain parts like launching the crew. And so even though, uh, commercial, entities will be the ones launching crews to the ISS, NASA is required to launch any crews to deep space on on the SLS. Uh, And so they're soliciting proposals basically for all pieces of (laughs) this puzzle, so long as it fits into these different categories. Uh, And they say that the intention is to develop the lunar descent vehicle first, because that's basically the first thing that they can start testing in, in 2024 which if you're following along at home is just six years from now. And that'll be just like a year after nominally SLS flies uh, for the first time. Okay. So, so let me just, let me just see if I understand, see if I've got this here. I mean, the main difference, we think about the Apollo missions, right? They took off from the earth. Everything was on board. They went into orbit around the moon. They went down to the moon in the lander. They went in the ascent vehicle back up to the command module. They attached the command module in the ascent module, and they came back home. They detached from the command module with the the reentry capsule, and they landed back on Earth. Just one mission to do the whole thing. So what's going to be different is that you're going to have the lunar gateway in its orbit not necessarily lunar orbit, but a cis-lunar orbit, and you're going to 
use this as a jumping off point. So you're going to be sending crew to the to the to the space station, and then people are going to be going from the space station, kind of like attached Soyuz modules, down to the moon and back up to the space station. And so you've got this sort of separation of when these missions will happen, from when people will show up at the station to when they're going to go down to the moon. Is that is that like the main difference here yeah so so there's here's a benefit of this crazy system uh this complicated system is that if you remember back to apollo three astronauts would blast off from earth two of them would walk on the moon in this setup a given mission would launch four astronauts all four of whom would land on the moon uh to carry all those people and the extra cargo and everything that they would need basically means that it won't all fit on one rocket so we built saturn 5 uh, for the Apollo, we were able to do it all in one piece, but we could only sort of launch two people to the surface. Now, by breaking it up into sort of four smaller launches, uh, all of which would not fit on the Saturn V, by the way. So even if SLS was as powerful as the Saturn V, it couldn't do all these pieces. Um, we can sort of more effectively deliver cargo and crew to the surface, um, but at the cost of a tremendous increase in complexity. Right. And and, uh, and that's a trade off. But it, I mean, I mean, I, I don't think it's it's that crazy because there were many points of failure with the the Apollo mission. In this case, you've really just got to focus on one step of the task, right? Like right now, NASA is worried about getting astronauts to the International Space Station, having them do their mission on the station, and then getting back home from the station. And you would see a similar thing where there is a dedicated, very dependable way to get astronauts to the Deep Space Gateway. We know that people can survive on the Deep Space Gateway, and then there's a way for them to come back home. And then you've got the whole separate challenge of getting people down and back from the surface of, of the moon. It does seem complicated, but it also does seem like more in similar to the way that we travel to and from places here on Earth. You know, you don't throw... You had to throw away the lunar lander, the ascent module, the command module, the all of the stages of your rocket. Like everything was thrown in the garbage, and all that came home was the little command module. In this case, I'm trying to think what gets thrown away. I guess it all depends on what happens with the ascent module and the and the lunar lander. Does the whole thing come back to yeah, the? I suspect the descent and ascent modules uh, will not be reusable, um, but I don't think NASA is mandating one way or, or the other at this proposal stage. Uh, let me throw out one word that we haven't mentioned at all, and uh, that's Orion. Uh, NASA has spent billions of dollars in the last decade developing the Orion crew capsule uh, to fly on top of the SLS. Uh, but this proposal is basically a tacit admission that Orion can't fulfill any of the three roles uh, laid out here uh, in in the mission. And they're not even sort of considering it as part of this lunar this lunar mission architecture. And so that kind of makes you wonder like what the point of Orion is at all, which remember is a spacecraft that has never flown. Well, it, the, no, the test Orion flew, the test Orion capsule flew. That's true. The, te the test Orion capsule flew once. It hasn't flown again. It's not expected to fly until after SLS is flying now. But these, this timeline, 2024 for the launch of the descent module, 2026 for the test of the ascent, descent, and crew transfer modules. Now, forget about who's going to build the space station. All of this is going to happen in only a couple of years after SLS uh, flies successfully for the first time which is when Orion was supposed to start flying. Mm -hmm. So how does it fit? NASA isn't intending to use that to launch astronauts to the space station because they've contracted with Boeing and, and SpaceX to do that. So where in this picture is Orion and, and what's, what's the point of continuing to develop it? Well, I mean, Orion, I mean, the, the plan for Orion is for the EM one mission and i don't i mean there the plan is the the next use of orion or, or until this um the plan was to was to put several humans in the orion capsule launch them on on an sls out beyond the orbit of you know beyond low earth orbit 
and and that is the next that was going to be the first use of the sls and the orion and then you're going to see follow-on missions which would start to build the deep space gateway so i don't know i mean you still are going to have a bunch of orions used for for that process and then at a certain point the orion still seems like the ideal spacecraft to send crew to the deep space gateway I mean, the Crew Dragon and the Starliner aren't going to be capable of, of doing that without being upgraded. Yeah, well, it's interesting that NASA is talking about this crew transfer vehicle, but they're not specifically talking about Orion. You're right. It feels like Orion's role would be to, to yeah. do that shuttle between, say, the ISS and the Lunar ga Gateway. Um, so, you know, why... Like, why, why aren't they saying that's just what we're going to do? We already have that piece bid on the other parts. It's it's it seems like they they believe that Orion isn't cut out to do that without saying why, and that makes you wonder sort of what you know what they were thinking ten years ago when they were outlining the the Orion program, um, and and what they were imagining and what's changed. Why why is this so different than what they were sure enough ten years ago that they were actually going to start building hardware? Yeah. So we'll find out. Yeah. They have a, basically a few months to make proposals. NASA is going to select, they're very careful to say, uh, two, one, or zero of those proposals uh, <laughs> yeah. to do sort of a more uh, in-depth study. And then potentially one of those will be s selected and given hundreds of millions of dollars to build basically a, a prototype that by 2024 would fly to and, and land on the moon. And, and the thing that's really important to note, right, is that all of this is under the under the long shadow cast by the SpaceX Starship and and Super Heavy. If if Musk's plans come true and it isn't on ridiculous Musk time, then sometime this year we're going to see hop tests of the of the Starship prototype. Next year we're going to see the actual Starship fly. Um, and then within a, a couple of years after that, we're going to see the full stack go. And it should, one of the things it can do is go to the moon and come back. So, so it's going to seem strange to have this really complicated architecture when, in theory, SpaceX can offer a much more simplified version, not to mention what's going to happen with, with Blue Origin. But at, at the same time, you can't live in this Elon Musk, FOMO, right? This fear of missing out where where they're like, don't worry about any of this, your these traditional methods, because SpaceX has got you covered. Don't worry about it. Like, you've got to wait until you see those twin engine twin rockets land perfectly at Cape Canaveral that you know that okay, fine, you did it, Musk. Well, we'll see what happens uh, in the next couple of years, but this is, let's, you know, we're kind of poo-pooing this a little bit. This is a serious, important step towards going back to the moon. And this is NASA sort of putting its money where its mouth is saying, yes, we're going to fund the studies necessary to get this project started. And we're looking at a timeline that isn't decades from now. We're looking at a timeline in the next 10 years to start making these trips happen. And if you wanted to see astronauts back exploring deep space this is yeah. the best news that we've had in, yeah. in many years and, and that's just outstanding yeah. and astro b is making a comment in the in makes a comment uh landing on the moon must be far easier than mars this is exactly it right that that the moon is close and the logistics of trying to do this with a fairly quick mission compared to the just the complexities and the level of infrastructure that's going to be required to get people to go to Mars. We're going to learn so many lessons in this process. And so I, if you, you know, if you made me choose moon or Mars, I would totally pick the moon and, and I wouldn't wait for Musk to, to provide salvation. I would continue with the traditional way of doing things until Till SpaceX shows up with the spacecraft capable of doing this mission. So I think this all makes sense. And I would love to see humans walk on the surface of the moon soon. Well, so. if you ask me to pick the moon or Mars, I would pick Venus. <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Everybody would so. pick Venus. You want to you land humans on, on Venus, Kimberly? <laughs> Robots. Robot humans on Venus. You're going to Just... let robots come for our astronaut jobs, too? They've already <laughs> taken every other job on Earth. Now yeah. you're giving them the jobs in space? 
Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That's the plan. He's talking up to the machine here. <laughs> All right. So it'll serve me well um, one day. One one last little piece of robot news. Uh, just wanted to show people. Oh, I had the. Where'd it go? Oh, here it is. Okay. So uh, the NASA's uh, Mars Insight lander, of course, uh, is still going strong. It set out its let's see the picture here. So it put out its um, seismometer last week a couple of weeks ago and then just put a cute little windshield over top of the seismometers to to now protect it and start taking its detailed uh, information about the the interior of Mars and it just set its hammer out onto the surface of, of Mars as well this is the heat probe and it's going to sit there for a little while and then they're going to start smashing it uh, into the regolith on Mars and the goal is they're going to try and get down to about a, a depth of about three meters. And it's going to use this sort of uh, pneumatic hammer approach. And so you, can see the, you can see the picture of the, uh, of the larger device. And then this is what it's going to be doing. And so one of the big challenges, of course, is that it has to get down to this depth of three meters. And if they can't make it down, if it, if it encounters any large rocks on its way down, then it could threaten the science. It's going to take a lot longer for it to gather the kind of heat data that's coming out of the uh, the core of, of Mars. And so it's got to go three meters down, not run into any large rocks. And anybody who's ever dug a hole to try and plant anything or dig a fence post hole, the rocks are everywhere. So I really hope that they're able to do this. But they picked a spot on Mars that has no rocks. They they specifically went for an area that seems to be rock free so we'll see how how well this works and this is the measurement that's going to help us understand how heat is being dissipated from mars right yeah they want to they want to be able to find out how volcanically active or dead mars is thanks to knowing uh how quickly heat is emanating out of the core of of mars and in fact there was a great piece of research that just came out like a couple of days ago on uh, eos.org about the oh, fact really? that uh, that Mars might be more volcanically active than we uh, than we thought. That's true. You I should, didn't write that one. You should but check it was that out. Exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You no. Should check well, out it was, eos.org. there was a bunch of, of press. There's a big flurry of press releases that came out of um, the AGU just in the last couple of days. So we're actually reporting on that one as well. Over at University. Good to know they're still doing things over there. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we've reached the end of our, our hour. Um, Morgan, what are you working on? Well, so this guy named Fraser Kane tells me that uh, in two Mondays from now, I'm going to be on his talking person show. <laughs> That's right. And I don't know what I'm going to be doing there, but I'm going to be talking, and I assume there'll be space involved and, and things like that. So I'll let him tell you when and where that is and what we'll be doing but you can tune in to see me see me there uh yeah well and actually on monday my other guest is going to be kimberly so Hi. <laughs> so on uh, actually so if if you're really i scrape in the bottom of the barrel here are I you see. kidding i'm you're reaching for the stars yeah you really it's, i'm reaching well, for the I just stars here both of us so yeah. you know you're just, just Cycle from one show to the next. Um, no, so so just on Monday, uh, I had uh, Jason Wright, who was, of course, uh, Kimberly's uh, advisor, PhD advisor, and we just really spent the whole show just gossiping about Kimberly and her oh, her love of mega structures. Um, yeah, yeah. If, although he, Jason, admitted that he was the one who put the idea of mega structures in everybody's mind so he That's took true. responsibility for it and you were on his team i think i was you I have i'm the second author okay <laughs> not the first author right right i'm saying that your responsibility <laughs> is is implicit but yeah so kimberly's going to be joining me on monday on my youtube channel for open space a week after that morgan is going to be joining me and this will be a chance for me to just like they're here and they join us every week, but I we're so we rarely get a chance to understand what they're working on and you know what makes them tick. So we're going to get to the bottom of, of of both of them, and I think it's going to be great. So that's on Monday, Kimberly. The week after that, it's going to be it's going to be Morgan, and we already talked to Paul uh, two weeks ago. So 
it's and then I will have run out of weekly space hangout co-hosts to, to practice on and then I'll move on to to other guests to real people to real people yeah exactly we're not real people yeah but Kimberly in addition to this thrilling uh, interview that's going to be happening on the weekly space hangout what are you working on well so I spent my whole day writing an ode to opportunity uh, and going through all the amazing pictures that have and signs that have come out of this mission over 15 years. You can check that out on eos.org. And then this week, I will be covering some of the great science coming out of the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting, which is taking place this weekend in Washington. So you can also check out some of those stories on eos.org. Have I said the name enough? I don't know if I have. Uh, and of course, I'm going to be on Fraser's show Monday night. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Well, and, and like I said, um, the interview with Jason, although we actually didn't mention Kimberly at all, was was wonderful. Uh, didn't even mention we me. Didn't, we, we, he and I were talking about it beforehand. Gosh, yeah. The one person you both know. Yeah. And but yeah. but it was it was a real treat. And I think that it was one of the best just conversations that I've had a chance to have. I, I can't imagine how entertaining it must have been, Kimberly, to have him as a PhD advisor because he's so he knowledgeable. And highly recommend. And 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 with his tenure now, he is just he's unleashed. He is un, he is no one can stop him. So uh, I think it was it was just great to talk about. We talked about techno signatures, obviously, and uh, just the the work that he's been doing with exoplanet research and uh, all of the interesting projects and the the really interesting radio velocity uh, telescope that he's working on now, which is going to be just hopefully it's going to be a dramatic step forward in, in finding exoplanets. So uh, yeah, if you missed that interview, I highly recommend it. And that's on my that's on my channel. All right, I'm going to put us here in the gallery view. There we all are. Uh, again, thanks to Luciano, uh, Luciano, Luciano Les for joining us this week. Uh, that was amazing to hear the, the science directly from the source. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Thanks, of course, to everyone watching. Thanks to our mods. Thanks to my co-hosts. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>